is an area where you can get some very strange looks from people. When some people are instantly switch off and think it's all rather strange. It's only when you give it a bit of time and actually think through what is possible, what our students are already experiencing in many of the games that they play, that that's when you start to realise that yes, this has got a lot of merits, there are lots of things that you could do with this, and that's what we've been allowed to try. Multi-user virtual environments, otherwise known simply as virtual worlds, are being explored by an increasing number of people on a social basis. But what's their potential as an educational tool? And what are the practicalities of bringing them into the classroom? My initial reaction was one of, I'm not sure if I'm into this. It, it seemed a very strange environment. You met strange people. They came up and spoke to you. You flew around. It all seemed rather bizarre, to be honest. But as a teacher, I found that it had so many possibilities for use with young people that this is what we wanted to explore further. Although there are a number of different virtual worlds currently available to internet users, Second Life is by far the largest, with over 15 million users across the globe. Second Life residents can buy their own 3D houses, attend virtual live entertainment events, or visit one of the 25,000 islands contained in the virtual space. We linked up with South East Grid for Learning and the Open University to go into Scone Park and start to do some work there with our students. And this was something that we saw as being very exciting. Because this is in this sort of gaming environment, it would be something that lots of children, I'm sure, would initially sign up to. But there was a risk there that we could sort of go too big too quickly, so we decided to take a very, very small number of students in and then see, as an experiment, what it would be like for them to use this. Hi, my name's Daniel. I am a Year 9 pupil and I'm here at John Anson School. If you want to start Scone Park, you just double-click this icon here and it will start loading up. Down here is where your avatar, which your character name is. Just to move around, you use the arrow keys and that just operates the camera angle and where you walk. And If you hold page up, you can fly. It gives you a better view of your surrounding area. And if you scroll in, you can go into mouse look and you move around and you can see different things from wherever you are, as if you were the person that you are on this game. Well, Daniel very rapidly got in world and, and was keen to experiment with the building of things. And I noticed within the first few days that he was straight into experimenting with building all sorts of objects. He has a particular love of, of steam, trains, traction engines, all those sort of things. And within the first couple of weeks, he built an exhibition of the history of steam. When I was around two weeks old, my dad took me to my, one of my first steam rallies and I was just born with steam in my blood basically and that's how it all started and I go every Sunday to the steam yard where we keep all the engines. Well over here is a vintage ploughing scene with two steam engines at either side and they winch the plough across the field which ploughs the ground like a modern tractor would do today. Part of the project, they have to actually apply for planning permission. And he was trying to get planning permission for his steam exhibition. And there were people who were perhaps object objecting to this, not terribly happy about what he was planning. But he held a sort of good argument about that and, and kept coming back saying, well, I think this is the reason why I want to do this. And he was justifying this. For me, I saw another side to him, which, was, which I thought was quite exciting. And he held his own and got the planning permission and then was able to start to build the project. It's a good feeling because you know that you might not in real life get what chance to own something, but you can own something on Second Life, which is much easier as well. You don't have to get all dirty and different things. But Scone isn't just for steam enthusiasts. We built like um, some squares and we joined them together and um, we made like a barrier around the side and raised it and stuff and we built some football goals. You like put layers of bricks on and then you change the colour and it can look like a football stadium. Excellent. And if you walk up to this, you can set it to physical. So that if you edit it, you can go into object and then you click physical there and you can kick things. Right, so you've made the ball something that you can now actually physically kick around the pitch. Now you could have the Second Life football team who turn up in here at Scone Park and have a match. All right? And there may be other sports that could be created in this way. 
Yeah. One sport I did with um, Topper is sumo wrestling on the um, volcano. Right. In order to get onto Scone Park, you have to uh, be invited to join. The staff in there are CRB enhanced checked and therefore that sort of very tight security. That was important because if we're taking encouraging students to go in, we wanted to make sure it was the most safe environment for them to take part in. At the other end of the country, another SCOME project has been running, but with a very different focus. What we need to do is we need to grab a load of pictures so that you know, you know, basically the dimensions and how it looks, because you need to make it look the same in the virtual world as it looks in the real world. This is a skin and grove jetty, and it was built with the um, slag from the actual steelworks. Um, and it's fallen into disuse because the ships no longer come in. But in talking to the community here in Skinning Grove, they wanted to bring the jetty back to its former glory and, and use it for tourism purposes. So then the idea came about that one of the ways to vision how that would look would be to build it in virtual reality. We'll use the other pictures you took as a guide for us to build the virtual jetty. So the process will be to build something that looks like that and then the textures that you took of the brickwork on the side will apply to the virtual jetty and it should look pretty much like that. So now this is the real, we're going to build the virtual, okay? We approached um, Eston City Learning Centre because the students were interested in making a film about engineering and we got a phone call back saying that Teesside University were running um, a Second Life virtual reality project about Skin and Grove and we're looking for people to approach and we were like, yes, definitely, um, yes, please count us in. And it kind of snowballed from there, really. So we're here today at the um, Red Queen Cleveland City Learning Centre to take the pictures you took yesterday and what you learned last week about building in Second Life to build the jetty. They're applying something they've learned into a real, it's not, it's strange to say real because it's a virtual world, but it is a real application. Now, where on earth could you give a bunch of youngsters a space to build Skinning Grove Jetty with some stairs going up to it out into the sea? You know those pictures you took yesterday? And the simplest way to get them into the computer was to stick it into your USB port and we'll be able to grab the pictures that you took yesterday. So it's from these pictures that we're going to grab the texture that we apply to the side of the jetty. We find that our students are very eager to take on information we give them, but they're less eager to actually go out and research things themselves and promote themselves. So it's a really good opportunity to say, right, this is some individual learning. You need to learn the skills. You can bring the skills back, potentially teach staff, potentially teach students, and take it into skill sets other than the ones that they've been working on themselves for their futures. We're drawing the jetty so we can reconstruct it in second life. This is like the entrance to get onto the jetty and uh, that's the walkway. This is where all the um, like fishing area is, and that's the mini jetty. I want to be an architect, so it helps me design. So if you just start by building it straight off, then you don't, if something goes wrong, you don't know how to rectify it. You don't know the computer. If something goes wrong, you can fix it. I'll explain to you what we're going to do now. James, I'm going to give you some money. Not real money. To upload your texture costs 10 Linden dollars which is only about a penny, but if you look at the top right-hand corner of, of your Second Life clients, have you got any money? No. Can you recognise where I am in, in Sean Park? Yeah? Do you want to make your way to this terrace and I'll give you some money? Build yourself a fairly big block there. Oh, this is where I'm totally out of my depth because I've just figured this out now, so... And I'll leave you messing with this. It's quite a useful learning tool for me to let James loose on it and mess about with it and use his intuitive approach to it. And if he figures out how to do it, he can tell me and then I'll know. We have some students who are very confident in working by themselves, but they're not so good working in a group. And I've seen a change in the classroom situation of group work. One of the brightest students we have tends to hide his work from the others because he doesn't want them to be copying it, whereas now he's taking more of a sharing role and he's actually sort of saying, no, you want to do it this way, and he's taking on more of a teaching thing. So it is nice to see how the skill sets are changing and how they're working better with each other, really, through it. Right. There's some maths in here, isn't there? Five steps, yeah. 
What is the maths that's going on here? How high is that going to be? 0 0.5. 0 0.5. It's going to be 3.25. Now we're just readjusting the size of it so that it fits onto the main jetty itself properly. And then we'll build the second, the third, and fourth, and fifth step so that they're all exactly the same width and height, but they'll all be going up in steps. It's better than just a drawing because then, well, once you've drawn it, you can put it onto a 3D world and see how it would look in real life as well. So it's more of an insight. There you have it, virtual engineering. Second Life is ubiquitous because it's, it's the one, you know. There's stuff in there that you can do these engineering things, building blocks and stuff like that. Um, and so it has its value in that, for that reason. If you wanted to avoid the one that everybody's talking about, one of the very first ones on the scene was Active Worlds, it's still there. There's another one called RuneScape. And there's another one which is World of Warcraft. As well as educating pupils within this virtual world, Steve also runs training sessions for those in education keen to find out a little more. Has anybody you ever used any kind of a 3D world, and in particular um, Second Life, before? After showing them how to get an account, participants are left to explore. See that red pillar box? That's my house there. And you're welcome to visit. It's nicely furnished. There you go, it's up them steps there. Whoa. Just sit yourself down, make yourself comfortable. It's pretty advanced technologically, which is why it doesn't work all the time. Where are you? I don't see you anywhere. There's a pair of eyes. There's something weird about this, this room. It's my first time on Second Life, and Steve's directed me to his house. Uh, and the controls seem quite intuitive. Except there's an issue being able to see see what we see what we actually look like. Oh, that's quite good. I like that. Don't detach no. that. It's because you, you've only got a head. If you lose your head, you've got nothing. Actually, that's the good advice in so many different ways. <laughs> isn't it? This guy's just a head. He's just a pair of eyeballs. I think it's down to the graphic card configuration or something. It, it looks like there's an awful lot of possibilities on here. Already I've found places where you can go and listen to a music concert and found places where you can share resources potentially. Now if you've created that area where children could collaborate on there, that might be quite interesting. Um, you often find when you put children on a computer they'll become more forthcoming um, about what they want to say in a lesson than if you ask them to put the hand up or just, you know, whatever, contribute to a conversation. So this might be a more, um, just a more engaging way of doing it. Whether the novelty wears off or not, I don't know. This could go into schools because what I am seeing already, just the work that I've done, is that it touches on so many things. I mean, you could think of any subject on the curriculum and there will be ways of using it. Take modern foreign languages, for example. You can actually use a microphone with this. You could actually have students from one country meeting with students from another country and then taking part in discussions in th those languages. Really. It is endless. I don't see there will be any subject that in the end could not make use of this in some way.